Greetings from the far side of the galaxy, I'm Fury, your host with the most, here to bring you a story about titties. I had a joke about Babylon's you-know-whats, but I elected to cut it out because I'm not sure how YouTube's NSFW policy is gonna handle that. Do be sure to like and subscribe, and donate to my Ko-fi and Patreon for cool rewards. And remember that I do these videos by request, so do leave whichever Osamo hero you want next in the comments below. Anyways, today we're talking about the black-hearted she-devil, babying bastards and bullying boys, Babylon. Obligatory spoiler warning for chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, and the Jiang Shi Knight event. Babylon is a female transient who appears to be mostly humanoid. The only signs that she is a transient is the red in her hair and the single black eye. Which, thanks to a Tumblr post, I can only assume is Wilson's disease. Either that, or she's part hollow. Moving on, Babylon is the leader of the guild, the Ultimachi Genociders. I say leader because while she is the one that gives orders and does, well, everything, the actual guildmaster is Ark. The Genociders are based out of Otomachi Academy, a school which no longer exists, but that's a whole nother story we'll get to in a minute. Like their name suggests, the Genociders had one main goal, that being the total destruction of Tokyo and the game within it. We don't know Babylon's rule or role, but we do know her sacred artifact. It's that golden chalice she's always carrying and it comes with three very weird abilities. First, those who drink from its wine become addicted to it to the point that they can't think without it. Second, the wine can pool and form into a beast named Therian which can fight and be ridden. And thirdly, Babylon can apparently levitate the cup. It never comes up in the story or anything, but look at her artwork, it's what she's doing. Another weird thing is that unlike most other transients, Babylon does have a family, although it's one she created here in Tokyo. It consists of her, the mother, Surtur, the father, and their children, Ark, Azathoth, and the player in one of the past loops, I think. Babylon herself is from the world of Eden, the world based on Abrahamic mythology. We don't know much about how Eden works because we haven't exactly gotten to trouncing the world's worst child. We do learn a little about it in the Valentine's Extravaganza event. Eden apparently works on the basis of sacrifice, forcing others to bear sins and then discarding them to the wayside. Usually, those discarded end up in the world of Gehenna, Hasamo's fancy name for hell. And that makes sense considering who Babylon is based on, that being... Okay YouTube, I know I file these videos under entertainment, but these videos are primarily educational, so bear with me, okay? That's because Babylon is based on the, uh, whore of Babylon from the Bible. Let's just say the Bible isn't known for being particularly kind towards women. Before we get into the inspirations, I have to make an executive decision. Because if I keep saying the nah of Babylon, YouTube will murderize my channel, I'll just call her Mother Harlot. Like the SMT demon, because unsurprisingly, they're both based on the nah of Babylon. Getting into her inspirations, Mother Harlot comes from two passages of the New Testament, specifically Revelation 17. Allow me to change the background and music to something a bit more dramatic while I read you the passage. And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colored, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written. This part is written in all caps, so I'm legally required to read it like this. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman, drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. 
And the ten horns which thou saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. That is all we know about Mother Harlot, which comes directly from the Bible. There are further passages that have her involvement indirectly through the birth of the second beast, also known as the Antichrist. What these passages mean symbolically has been debated by Christian scholars for ages. Some thought the beast she was riding referred to the USSR, and others thought it referred to the Catholic Church. However, there is someone who thought it referred to something else. You see, when I said Babylon is based on Mother Harlot, I wasn't being totally honest. You see, way back in the day, there was this total goon named Aleister Crowley who founded this religion called the Lima. I'm not really going to explain it here because there is not enough time in the day. Just know, it's a mishmash of beliefs, including Egyptian, Gnostic Christianity, and Wiccan paganism. Within Thelema, Babylon was their matriarchal deity, consort to their patriarchal deity, Chaos. Although, it's worth noting that while she was the consort to Chaos, she was the counterpart to Therian, which is Thelema's name for the Great Beast. They believed that both Therian and Babylon would have human avatars to take up form in this world. Crowley believed himself to be Megatherian, but during his lifetime, at least seven women were said to be the avatars of Babylon. Hasamo doesn't take much from Thelema, which I understand, I can barely make heads or tail of it myself. So let's explain what was taken by looking into Life Wonders interpretations. Beginning where we left off with Thelema, the only thing Life Wonders really took was their names. It's why Babylon's name doesn't have a Y in it, and we learned through our research file that the name of her beast is Therian. The connection to Thelema might also explain why Babylon looks the way she does. Rather than being clearly fantastical, characters state time and time again that she looks like a regular high school girl. That might just be a reference to the avatars of the Thelemic Babylon just being regular women. Beyond that, everything the Bible describes in Revelations is a part of Babylon as well. There's her beast, Therian, who has ten horns, but only one head, sadly. And her sacred artifact is literally a goblet filled with wine. Side note, how messed up is it that goblet refers to a cup and not like a tiny little goblin? Jokes stolen from Tumblr aside, even the phrase made drunk with the wine of her fornication is referenced to her sacred artifact's ability. Even the chalice's design was lifted from the Bible as it is literally adorned with gold and precious gems. And the part about her dethroning kings is evident through Babylon's massive hate boner for Claude. Considering the actual material in the Bible is pretty light, I do think Life Hunters did a really good job with her. Even the part about being the mother of the Antichrist was brought into Asamo as her backstory, which is something I'll be getting into now. It begins with Babylon on the run as Angels of Eden finally catch their quarry. For Babylon had been condemned to death, regardless of the child in her womb. It was as the life drained from her body that she crossed the Rainbow Bridge into Tokyo. She found herself in Fujimi Academy, a testing grounds for the game, summoned at the behest of the experiment's only survivor, Ark. While the child she was carrying may have been gone, her summoner's wish was for a family, so her dream wasn't entirely unreachable either. But within that family was Azathoth, the world representative of the Old Ones who possessed a pillar artifact. That meant the knowledge of the loops Tokyo was going through was well within her grasp. She saw her family's destruction time and time again and came to one conclusion. The only way to free our family from this desperate struggle was to free them from the game itself. She decides to destroy Tokyo, and it's during her endeavors to make this plan a reality that we meet her in the main quest. Babylon's not actually in the main quest very much, none of the genociders outside of Ark really are. But Babylon probably leaves the most impact out of any of the genociders. Which is what I'm going to get into now since we're starting Babylon's character analysis. Out of all of Osamo's antagonists, I feel that Babylon was probably the best with Tezcatlipoca being second. 
What makes Babylon stand out to me is that the evil mother archetype has been done before. Think Mother Gothel from Rapunzel, or well, Tangled, but whatever, it's Rapunzel, get off your high horse, Pixar. What separates Babylon from the rest of the pack is that she isn't abusive, or okay, she's kind of evil, I'll give you that. My point being is that it's a breath of fresh air to get an evil mother who's actually a good mother. One moment she's crushing Claude beneath her heel, and the other she's consoling Ark as they have a panic attack. It also means she has a unique relationship with the protagonist. It also means she has a unique relationship with the protagonist. That's because she considers them worthy of being part of her family, a pitiable child who has nothing going for them. The protagonist isn't even really a player, they're the trophy that everyone fights for. The destruction of Tokyo is to their benefit as well. The irony of the protagonist enemies professing how this is for their own good as they fight is doubly ironic for Babylon. That's because she's acting just like the rulers she despises as she overrides their will deciding she knows what's best. But to boil down why I like Babylon so much, it's just that Life Hunters doesn't beat around the bush with Babylon being evil. She doesn't beat around the bush and justify herself, she knows she's committing sin and yet she's still a positive mother figure. Because she's forced into a directly antagonistic role in the main quest, we don't really get to see it there. But we do get to see a more sympathetic side during the event. Like Young She Knight, but I also want to pay attention to Envari's Beachside Summer and Valentine's Extravaganza. In Envari's Beachside Summer, her interaction with Volos is not only funny, but it points to Babylon's trauma. We don't actually get to see it much in the main quest, nor the events, it's usually an offhanded comment about not trusting men. So it's nice to see her get along with Volos, who has a comparable situation to Babylon. I also really like this moment from the event simply because we get to see Babylon acting a little goofy. Babylon often acts as a straight shooter, so it's nice to see a change of pace in the beachside but also the Valentine's event. There's just something touching about it. She utterly despises exercise, or well, jazzercise, but she's willing to take the hit if her children ask. It's kind of weird how Babylon's strongest moments come from the event she didn't get a limited unit in. How fitting that we mention Babylon's units because that's a section of the video we're getting to now. Our dear mother has three units, a normal three and five star and a limited four star from the Jiangxi night event. Her three star is a nether attribute one type unit and her first skill is moral rebel. All it does is let her deal nearly double damage to enemies with blessing. It would be pretty trash if not for her second skill, Benevolent One, which has a 50% chance to apply blessing to hit units and allies in one square around her. Together, her first and second skill combine to make something that has great offensive and defensive application. Her third skill, Enchantress, has a 20% chance of inflicting charm on a hit unit. Its proc sucks, but it's charm, so what do you expect? Her final skill is Conformity Crusher, which deals nearly double damage against ruler-type enemies. A surprisingly solid unit for a 3-star, so let's see if that holds up with her 5-star. Her normal 5-star is another attribute and spear-type unit, and it has 3 different skills. Enchantress gets replaced by Tailed Demon, which has a 100% chance to inflict curse on hit. Honestly, I'm not sure if it's better than Enchantress because Charm is just that good. Conformity Crusher becomes Sneering Harpy, which has a 90% chance to give her crit plus at phase start and extra damage against Berserkers. If only this applied to Berserker the Guild and not Berserker the Buff. Her second skill, Benevolent One, gets a skill Evo into Aspiring Benevolent Mother. It keeps the blessing but lets her apply Fatal Poison and Buff Reversal in a 2 squared diamond radius. The Fatal Poison has an 80% proc and the buff reversal has a 70% proc. She also gains a damage boost against paralyzed enemies. Honestly, I'm not too sure if the 5 star is better than the 3 star, but we'll address that in a second. Her final unit is a 4 star that comes from the Jiangxi Night Event. I never noticed this before, but her dress even has a gold outline of Therian on it. 
I kind of get why Ark wanted her to wear it so bad. I mean, it's a dress with their family dog on it. It's a sword type and grass attribute unit, and its first skill is Thirst Quencher. After moving, she applies nourishment and immobility to allies adjacent to her at 90%. The nourishment is nice, but immobility really does get in the way when half of all skills are on movement. The Artiste gives her an 80% chance for defense up at phase start and a 70% chance to gain up to 700 HP after attacking. Not a bad skill that ties into her overall strategy. Number 3 is Bloodstained Matron, which applies Blessing to allies in one square at 80% during phase start. And she takes reduced damage from one type enemies, so it's a fine skill that gives her some survivability. Finally, Devoted Dancer gives her a 90% chance to apply Archer to adjacent allies after moving and immunity to charm. If I didn't simp for Babylon before, I sure do now, cause Archer is one of the greatest things in sliced bread. Moving on to our two normal units, I actually think that the both of them can put in the work. I like the concept of applying blessing to enemies and then punishing them for daring to have it in the first place. Her 5 star skill evolution doesn't really help that much, but Fatal Poison is nice to have. But her 5 star also comes with the downside of being Spear instead of Wand, so do with that what you will. Due to these units' ability to bless the enemy, they work well with both Ark, which is fitting, and Bale, which is a little odd. Her limited 4 star from the Jiangxi Night event is really good. Its role is as a stalwart frontline wall that also focuses on healing other units. Emphasis on other units since she can't really heal her own HP. A good healer like Gabriel or Christmas Claude, ain't that a little ironic, certainly helps with that. Overall, all of Babylon's units are pretty good with all of them having a specific niche. Now that the video's winding down, let's hit up Babylon's relationship chart. To begin, no one likes Babylon. But Babylon does like her child, Ark. And on the flip side, Claude dislikes Babylon, which, yeah, that's fair. And Babylon herself dislikes Surtur and Sanat Kumra, likely due to them being large men with lots of power. And before I forget, Babylon does have one loading screen. She shares it with no one, and it reads, Half of the world. Pretty ominous, if you ask me. In conclusion, it's a shame Babylon died so early in the main quest because we don't get to see her very much. Narratively, she seemed to serve the role of a pseudo-world rep as she and them have a lot of similarities in how they work. With big, overarching plans that usually span multiple chapters rather than the one-offs of previous antagonists. The Genociders being a multifaceted fighting force rather than just the final boss and the army they stand behind. She's also like my second favorite character in Hasamo, so of course she gets Fury's official seal of approval. The Hasamo hero up next is everyone's favorite bird mom, Ziz. On Mondays and Fridays, I livestream, so do be sure to check that out while I move on to our Patreon shoutouts. Special thanks to our three star patrons, Zoro Ichao, 87 Werehog, and Prisma 144. Our four star tier is still empty. And for our Super d Duper 5 star shoutouts, we have... Unknown RC, who turned himself into a pickle. Funniest shit I've ever seen. Vanilla Flower, who has a lot to learn, but I believe he can save the world. And Mahogasaur, who has a head of fiery hair and a turbocharged backpack. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and donate to my Ko-fi and Patreon. And as always, this is your host Fury, signing out.